So now we come to the end of James chapter 2 and the end of this section dealing with uh, justification by works and the connection of works and faith. And here from verse 21 down to verse 24, Abraham and Rahab, two very different characters, are brought forward by James to illustrate what he has been teaching. Now let's just have a wee look at the structure here from verse 21 down to verse 24 because he asks a question here in verse 21, was not. And then in verse 22, do you see? Second question and they're linked. Then a conclusion down here in verse 24 which again flows from these two questions. And we have this verse 23, which I'm going to box, that sits in between these two questions and the conclusion. Now we will see by way of structure that this word perfect here at the end of verse 22, I would suggest, and we're going to hopefully see, is connected into verse number 23 and really expands this word perfect and by works, faith was made perfect. What does that mean? Well, down to verse 23, and you've got two concepts there. Two, well, you've got a scripture quotation, and then you have a statement, and he was called the friend of God. So here, there are two examples. And the first example would be an example greatly esteemed and respected by the readers of this letter, because he refers to Abram as our father. And that, by the way, is interesting, because Paul refers to Abram in the same way when he's dealing with justification by faith in Romans chapter 4. So the question here in verse 22 is, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Now we'll speak about that in a moment, but here he's referring to events in Genesis. Well known by those with a Jewish background. And then verse 22, once he has referred to the events of verse uh, events in Genesis in verse 21. In verse 22, he asks a question, and the question is just this, can you not see, do you not see, and he's referring to the things up here in verse 21. So do you not see, or do you see that faith was working together with his, faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect. What does that mean? Verse 23, and then down to verse 24, here we have the conclusion that he draws from the example of Abraham, Genesis chapter 15, as we'll see, Genesis chapter 22, and his conclusion is that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So let's go back up to verse 21. Uh, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son on the altar? Now there can be some confusion when we think about the issue of um, justification in the Bible. And here James is emphasising uh, justification by works. When you go back into the book of Romans, you discover that Paul, in his epistle, is emphasising justification by faith in chapter 4. And we'll have a think about that shortly. But it's interesting here in verse 21 that he says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when... So there's a point of time being referenced here. And the point of time is that when he offered Isaac his son on the altar. So at that point when he offered Isaac his son on the altar, which of course is Genesis chapter 22. That's the historical account that's being referred to here. He says at that point that Abram our father was justified by works. Let's think first of all a little bit about the, the, con the connection between being justified by faith and being justified by works. And to do so, we come over to the book of Romans briefly and uh, chapter 4. And we have here the first uh, three verses of Romans chapter 4. So let's just read these verses. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, and there again is our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now the important thing that Paul's establishing here is in this little expression, particularly these two words here. Paul is teaching that before God, 
Abraham was justified by faith alone. And that works would not allow Abraham to boast before God. Paul is speaking about his standing before God. It's really a courtroom scene and the declaration, the judicial declaration of God in relation to his salvation. And that is by faith alone. Now, elsewhere also, it's interesting that justification is also uh, linked to uh, blood, justified by blood, justified by grace, justified by works, by faith. And the context in which these expressions are found are very important. So in Romans chapter 4, it's a courtroom scene. We're standing before God. We stand condemned and then we are justified. And these two expressions are opposite. Um, condemned and justified. They're both legal terms. And they're both declarations, judicial declarations. And we have our judicial declaration changed from being condemned to being declared to be righteous, justified, and that is by faith in the book of Romans. And here Paul is referring to what takes place in the book of Genesis. So let's have a look at Genesis chapter 15, and again we'll read these verses, because this is the experience of Abraham. And it says that after these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. There's the expression. That's the familiar expression that we've come across. I'll just box that out. So in Genesis chapter 15, promises are made to Abraham by God. These promises were fulfilled in the birth of Isaac. And now Abraham is going to be tested when you get to Genesis chapter 22. And he's going to be tested in relation to Isaac. Isaac, the fulfillment of this promise that he believed. And now Isaac is going to be the centre of God's testing on Abraham. To test his faith and the reality of it. Abraham believes God. Abraham says he believes God. He is trusting God that in Isaac all the promises of God will be fulfilled. Now the question is, do you really trust God? Do you really believe? Well, where is the proof? Where is the demonstration? Where is the evidence? And that takes us back into our section in James chapter 2, back to verse 21. The question, was not Abraham our father justified by works when? And that takes us back to that occasion in Genesis chapter 22, when he was willing to take his only son, the son that was so special to him, that had been born in such miraculous circumstances, and to offer that son on the altar. You can just imagine Abraham coming back down the mountain with Isaac, with the circumstances of Genesis 22 completed, and now there is the demonstration that can be referred back to. There is the evidence. Abraham was willing to raise that knife and plunge it into his son. He believed that he and his son Isaac would come back down that mountain no matter what. And he demonstrated that belief. He demonstrated that he really did believe that God would fulfill his promises in Isaac and through Isaac and was willing to raise the knife over his son and plunge it into his son, believing that both of them would come back down the mountain. There is the evidence. There is the work that proves his faith was real. And so we come down to verse 22. Do you see? Can't you see? There it is. It's evident. It's demonstrable. It can be seen. That faith was working together with his works. And by works, his faith was made perfect. Now that begs the question, in what way was his faith made perfect? Well, we come down to verse number 23. 
And it's interesting that you've got two ideas here in verse 23. You've got this scriptural quotation here. That Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And then you get this next little expression. And he was called the friend of God. Now he was never called the friend of God until after Genesis chapter 22. But here we see that Abraham's belief was demonstrated, was provable, and therefore by works his faith was made perfect. It's not that there was something lacking in his faith or deficient in his faith, but now his faith has been proved, it's been tested, it's demonstrable, and now he has this title, the friend of God. So we then come to the conclusion in verse 24. So we have the question in verse 21, the question in verse 22, the conclusion in verse 24, that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now, Paul uh, teaches, as we've seen in Romans, that a man is justified um, by faith alone. But that is in relation, as we have seen, to a courtroom before God, James is speaking about four men. So again, let's just go right back up to the top here and get the flow of thought. The question, was not Abram our father justified by works? Referring to the events of Genesis chapter 22. Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect, demonstrable, tested, proved to be real? Therefore, in verse 23, the scripture was fulfilled, which says that Abram believed God and was accounted him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Down to verse 24, so you can see that a man is justified by works, not before God, but before men, and not by faith only. Now we come to this section in verse 25 and verse 26, as we finish off these two examples, and we now have the very strange example of Rahab especially in the context of Abraham. You have Rahab is very different from Abraham. You have this female as opposed to a male. You've got a Gentile as opposed to the patriarchal figure. Um, and you also have a person who is a harlot as opposed to the, the man Abraham who is held as being a man who was the friend of God. And when you go back into the book of Joshua, you discover the, the narrative in relation to Rahab. And it's very interesting and the narrative is just briefly summarised here, that she too was justified by works. Now, you can go again into the book of Romans, and you'll discover her faith is mentioned. In the same way that Abram's is. But here the emphasis is upon her works. It's what she did to prove the reality of what she said. She said to the spies that she believed. I'll put this, she believed. It's what she said when she received them. And she believed because of what she had heard when they had come through um, the Red Sea, which was 40 years previous, and then defeated the kings of Sihon and Og, which was just very recent. And so she believed. She said she believed. But then she proved her faith. And she proved it by her works. And her works are described here. She received the messengers. She sent them out another way. So what she did was demonstrating that she really did believe. She was staking it all upon the God of Israel and the messengers who represented the God of Israel. So she's, she was willing to risk her life to protect these messengers and did so by receiving the messengers and sending them out another way. Now it is interesting. There is no mention of her speaking to the king's soldiers. That's another issue as to whether she told the truth or not and whether she should have told the truth um, on that occasion. But that's not the issue here. Her works are receiving the messengers and sending them out a different way. Now you come to the conclusion of the whole section in verse 26. And we've seen it from Abraham and we've seen it from Rahab demonstrated in Old Testament history this truth. And now we have um, from the natural sphere. 
which everyone can relate to. A body, the idea really is a body without um, breath, and without spirit, without breath. For as a body without breath or without spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So you have the appearance of life. You have the form, but you have no reality. Please excuse the writing here. You have no reality. So his conclusion is that those who say, profess, who say they believe, who say they have faith, but there is no work, there are no works to demonstrate the truth and reality of that faith. James concludes that without works, there is no faith. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And the challenge to Christians is to identify whether they have an empty profession or whether their professed faith is real and is demonstrated and tangible and seen and can be pointed to in its evidence in the works that should be present in the life of a Christian. James chapter 2, um, and we've seen works and faith combine. Thank you.